conversations that I was having with the, the owners here and a few other people about this idea or concept that in certain arts, certain art forms, you have this zone that one can attain to and getting into the zone is a, is a kind of emptiness and you have to be able to empty out and to be in this zone in order to really perform. And this is true for many different lineages. Uh, it's true of dance, uh, it's true of acting. The, the, the main actor's website tells you, um, we're just in time, we just started, it's okay. We prepared a, a, a plinth for you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this idea then that within these, uh, these art forms and martial arts, and maybe even things like um, uh, rock climbing or things like this, you get into a zone and to really perform well, to really do well, you've got to be in this zone of emptiness. Now there was some discussion we were talking last week and I'm very open to opinions and if there's no questions afterwards actually I might ask you the questions. Um, this idea of is the zone the same in meditation as it is for performing arts? Like a martial artist, um, when they're really silent and still and they're really hitting that spot. Uh, are they in the same, is this also meditation? Is this also what we're doing with meditation? Or is there a difference? Is it the same zone but a different purpose? That was one proposition that was made. Is it the same zone but uh, for the performing arts you're always turning and facing outwards rather than facing inwards. That is, you're, you're making the action rather than just being empty for emptiness sake. So I think it's an interesting question. One explanation that I would furnish is the difference between the conscious and the unconscious mind. When you are learning something, you use the conscious mind. And the conscious mind is a very slow learner, it's a very poor learner. Uh, it's very poor at doing things, rather. But it's, uh, sorry, accelerated learning, but it's very poor at doing things. 
Uh, so if you remember back to when you're learning to drive and you're trying to figure out, uh, these days you all do automatics, but when I was younger we had the gear shift, stick shift. And to try and coordinate your, your clutch with the gear stick and everything and your indicator and everything else you're doing took a lot of effort and it's quite difficult. But once you've done it for a while it just becomes automatic, you don't even need to think about it. You just have the vague idea of change gear and it happens. This is something similar that um, happens in something like dance. Um, you have to learn all the moves first, but once you've learned all the moves, to really perform, you get into that silent spot. It's the same in martial arts, it's the same with uh, boxing and many other languages. Now the conscious mind is, a, is not very good at doing things. The unconscious mind is much better at doing things, but the unconscious mind can't learn very fast. So a lot of animals like cats, <coughs> they're not very good learners. They may manipulate you emotionally, but they can't learn new tasks very well. Uh, they don't have this insight learning that, say, monkeys or higher mammals actually have this insight learning. So they can actually get something, and when they get something, they know it for the next time. I actually did a whole talk on this last year, so you have to be there for that one. So if I was to put a plank of wood across the floor and ask you all to walk across this plank of wood, pretty easy, you can do it without thinking about it. But if I was to put this plank of wood very high up on a building with a big drop, suddenly it would become very difficult. Why is it becoming more difficult to do something consciously than unconsciously? What happens is the conscious mind starts to get involved and starts to worry and starts to think and starts to carry all this baggage around with it. Uh, and then that makes the whole job more difficult. So when we're learning these kind of uh, things, including meditation, we have to use the conscious mind to do the best that we can to learn something. But then we have to pass that learning into the unconscious, for the unconscious to do it. Now I would, prop I would propose that the same is true uh, of meditation also. One of the things that we have to do is the conscious mind is still there, you're still very awake, you're still very aware, still very conscious, but you're not carrying with you all of your concepts. All of these concepts and ideas and yourself and your worries and your aspirations, if you start bringing these into the activity with you, then you make it much more difficult. And if you're doing a dance performance or if you're uh, even rock climbing, something like that, if you're bringing with you all your thoughts and worries, etc., then it's, you're not going to be able to perform to the right degree. The conscious mind has to stop still and it's the unconscious mind that carries on with the activity. And this is very much the same with meditation. We have to unload all of the concepts that we've brought with us. Our concepts, uh, or the God complex, as, uh, uh, as I was talking about last week, which is where you think you know, you think you have, it, you think you have the world figured out. The truth is, you don't know, you don't have the world figured out. Um, what is life? What is living? What is consciousness? What is memory? What happens when you die? What is rebirth? What is non-duality? Uh, what is non-attachment? All these kinds of things, you can't figure them out. If you try to figure them out, probably you'll go crazy. Or you end up with this working set of constructs and ideas that then you argue with other people about. Right? Somebody asked the Buddha, why are there wars? And he said, there are wars because because people live in sense desire. And then he added a caveat, he said, but religious people fight wars over ideas. So if you're carrying around this, all of these ideas that you carry around with you, you have to unload, you have to offload, uh, in order to get to this um, point of awareness, or sharpness, or concentration, uh, or mindfulness. Now that doesn't mean that you become dumb or stupid, you always keep your intelligence with you, you keep your senses of discernment with you, uh, but you're unloading the, the ideas that you're carrying around. Uh, my example is like, um, uh, like a, a dog. A dog has a working understanding of the world around it. It knows who feeds it, it knows who, it's like, who it likes. When something happens in the world, in the temple, you know, there are certain 
things that are very important to dogs. Have you ever noticed in the morning when the temples ring the gong, all the dogs start howling? This is a tradition, this is a dog tradition or superstition, I'm not sure which. Uh, so a dog has a working understanding of the world around it, but it can't understand economics or democracy or traffic or ownership or uh, all these kinds of things that we know about. I actually think, just my personal theory, but I think we're in pretty much the same boat when we're trying to figure out consciousness and rebirth and life and death and things like that. I think we're just not equipped to fully understand it. Certainly, if we are going to understand it, it's not, we're not going to understand it through uh, concepts. We get trapped in concepts, we get trapped in ideas. And once you cherish an idea and a concept, it's very hard to break yourself free from it. One example might be, um, uh, what's his name, Walter Freeman. And he was the guy who did 2,500 lobotomies across the states. A lobotomy is where you put a, the original form, which they insert the knife in the side of the head and swing it around, basically. And they want to cut your frontal cortex from the rest of your brain. Um, and he had a real belief that all the problems of character were due to too much frontal cortex. And if you can just slice, slice it up a bit, you'd be cured. Uh, 2,500 lobotomies later, uh, the guy still believed it. He, he believed it right to the end of his life. He created all these zombies, these living zombies, by doing this operation. Later on, they used uh, the ice pick method, and they used to put this ice pick-like device in through the eye and wave it around behind your brain, hoping that's going to cure you of a mental sickness. He got trapped into this idea. He really believed this idea, despite the evidence that was right in front of him. To practice Dharma, we have to really empty out all of these concepts that you carry around with you and be willing to look afresh, be willing to look completely new, uh, according to Dharma, according to truth. Now, I have one example. Um, in the winter time in England, and all the mothers around England would be saying to their kids, are you warm enough? Have you had enough breakfast? Have you eaten your ready break, central heating for kids? Does anybody remember that? One person. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> okay, it's a kind of porridge. Um, have you had your, your porridge? Uh, have you got enough jumpers on? Do you need your scarf? Button your coat up. Okay, you're going to be all right, and then she'll release you out into the freezing cold where you're going to get the bus to school. And then you get to school, and the teacher says, right, strip off, shorts and a t-shirt, and go and stand out in this field. <coughs> and they called it games, they called it sport. And to my mind, it wasn't, games are supposed to be fun. And that wasn't fun, you know. All the kids the day before, they would churn, you know, the real footballers with their studied boots, they would churn the field up. And then it would freeze overnight. And then by the time we got there, it would be like jagged rocks. And so there I was, out in this field. I was always putting goal, because I couldn't run. Um, standing out there in goal, in a, in a cold, windy field, like a frozen horror popsicle, standing in front of the, the goal, and then a big hairy kid would come, would, after a few minutes, would come tearing down with the ball and he'd take a shot at goal. And talking about getting into the zone, I would end, I, I, this one time I entered into the zone. I, I didn't need any conscious thought uh, to carry around with me. Something about being English, hundreds of years of playing football, we invented the sport, it's in our genes, it's in our blood. Something automatic took over. <laughs> And I made the most beautiful dive that any goalkeeper could ever imagine. Out of the way of the ball. <laughs> so my teacher, he comes running over to me and he says, What are you doing, you idiot? You're supposed to defend your goal. And I was like, That's not my way of thinking. <laughs> That ball was kicked at me at 40 miles an hour. A cold, wet ball coming at me like a leather whip. My way of thinking is not to stand in the way. <laughs> and <laughs> so the teacher, he went crazy. He was shouting at me, and I just laughed at him. 
Right. And I just laughed because there isn't any punishment that teacher can do to me that would be worse than being hit by the ball. <laughs> to me, the logic was perfectly clear. Uh, they used to divide us up in games, they used to divide us up into the county team players and the, the footballers and the, the tennis players and then the imbeciles. I was one of the imbeciles. <laughs> and so I figured out, in games, there's no exam, right? So if you never turn up for class on the first day of term, the teacher's never going to know you're not there, right? So that's what I did. On the way down to the pitch, I'd slope off in another direction, I'd go to the town library. And I'd sit there and I'd read, in a nice comfortable wall library, I'd read books. Which is why I now have a hand-to-eye coordination of a jellyfish, but I know lots of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to think anew, a lot of the things that you thought were good and real and entertaining and nice, when you view them through gamma, you start to see them differently. You start to see things as, uh, a lot of the things that you like to do, you find you no longer like to do. Some of the things that you like, that you didn't like to do, you now like to do. When you're willing to look afresh, when you're willing to, um, when you're willing to change to a different way of knowing. <coughs> Meditation is something similar uh, in that you have this working set of constructs that you carry around with you, and they all come from your mind. But when you stop and you look inside the mind, what you see, what you say to yourself is, stop and Watch, the, watch your breathing for the next 30 minutes. That's, what you, that's the instructions you give yourself. Easy, right? But your mind has other ideas. It's going to do that for about 15 seconds, and then it's going to go and do something else. So when you're starting to look at it in this light, and you're willing to look afresh, you see, well, whose mind is that? If I've told my mind to do something, and it does completely, something completely different, whose mind is that? When you go on a meditation retreat and you want to get very still and beautiful and holy, and what you see is more and more chaos. The mind goes more and more out of kilter, goes more and more off-center. You start to see things in a different light. Well, maybe this mind that is generating all my ideas and concepts, <coughs> maybe now that I can see it as, a, as, as almost madness, I know that's not going to be the solution, uh, the ultimate solution. So you have to look for a different way of thinking, a different way of being. And in Buddhism, that is mindfulness. This is the tool that we use. On the hero's journey, um, which is the, the path of enlightenment or the path of development, uh, that appears in all cultures, many, many cultures. On the hero's journey, the hero always has a weapon. Right? Luke Skywalker had his lightsaber. The weapon is usually something that's not considered valuable by society. It's usually something that isn't, isn't great. Even the, the lightsaber wasn't, you know, Han Solo said it can't replace a blaster and he had his, he, he had his hand blaster. Uh, Jack in the Beanstalk, he got five magic beans. And his parents thought they were, his mother thought they were worthless. And this is usually the way within these stories, the tool or the weapon that the hero uses to complete the impossible task it's usually something that's worthless or worth very little in the eyes of society. And there's a reason for this. Uh, other examples, uh, Samson and his hair, Rapunzel and her hair, that was, the, you know, <clears throat> that was her weapon. The reason for this is inside your psyche there is one small aspect that gets overlooked and that normal people consider to be fairly worthless or, or useless. And that is the aspect of mindfulness. Mindfulness is just being a little bit awake, a little bit aware. If you ask yourself a question, usually you have a, a few moments of mindfulness as you, you sit there and you wait for the answer to come, up, to come up. When you're making a decision about something, usually you, are, you have a little bit of mindfulness as you stop and you wait for that decision of, do I have that second cappuccino or not? and you stop, just there, there's a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of awareness. This quality of mindfulness and awareness isn't something that's really noticed or valued in most of society. In fact, most people don't even realize it's there. And even to a meditator, it can be quite hard to, to grasp uh, quite when you're being mindful and when you're not. The tendency of the human mind 
human being, uh, or as Gil Fossil called them, the human desiring, is to be absorbed in something. This is what we were talking about last week with grief, hatred, and delusion. We like to be absorbed into something that you like, something that you dislike, or something that's neutral. Anything. Just some kind of stimulation, some kind of activity, something to lose your awareness and your attention into. It's nice. It's comfortable. And this is why we like watching TV, reading the newspaper, chatting to friends, uh, etc. We like these nice, comfortable um, pastimes. If you give that up and you become mindful, the first thing you become mindful of is that just this crazy mind that you're with. You become mindful of dukkha, you become mindful of suffering. And this now is the key, this mindfulness and the suffering uh, of the dukkha. Um, this is the key. This is in the spiritual traditions. This is what people are saying is important. It comes up in different ways. Ramana Maharshi said, um, you ask yourself the question, who am I? When you realize there's no one there, you realize the self. This question of who am I is the, the hanging aware attention. Um, I gave you the koan last week, your man sits on the top of a hundred foot pole. How does he proceed? Sitting on top of a hundred foot pole is where you take your mind. When you take your mind to that point, that point of equipoise and balance, there's nowhere left to go. The mind can only become self-aware. And this is as we start the journey back towards your own awareness, your own self-nature or your own Buddha nature. So, this is the, um, as you practice the mindfulness, we come down to this dukkha, this feeling of the, the disquiet, the unsatisfactoriness. And this is the reality. This is the beginning of the path. Religion works in ideologies. Now we're trying to, now I'm trying to, to juxtapose the religion of ideology with the spirituality of imperfection. A religion starts with an ideology and clings to this is the truth, this is the way things are. True spirituality starts with imperfection. I don't know how things are. I suffer. There is something that has to change. I have to learn something new. This is a spirituality of imperfection. I can give you an example. Um, before I ordained, in fact many of you, when you look at ordained people, right, you have all these ideas. Uh, about what it's like, what we do, who we are, the rules that we follow. And we actually find it quite amusing. Because uh, usually you're way off. One or two people have been here and been amongst before, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, I read a story of a monk, this is before I ordained, I read a story of a monk and he was walking across India and he's part of one of these groups where the monks won't touch money. And uh, he was begging food in India, he had his bowl, he felt a little strange being a Westerner begging food of poor Indians, but uh, he had his bowl, and every so often somebody would come along and try and put money in the bowl, and he was from one of these Buddhist groups, uh, ordained Thai group systems that won't touch money. They will still buy things and have things, but somebody else has to carry the money and pay for it. And this is actually a tradition that I started in, and I thought this was normal and right. And so he talked about being in India, and every so often people would offer him money. Now if he accepts the money, he can go and buy something to eat. If he doesn't accept the money, he might not get anything to eat. And so he was talking about this quandary, and this thing, well, shall I accept money or not? And I thought to myself, <coughs> what a rubbish monk, worthless. Because if you've got an ideal, if you're holding on to an ideology, you should be willing to fight for it, you should be willing to die for it. I've read these stories of gurus and people who throw themselves off the mountainside uh, in the search for enlightenment, the Buddha who throw themselves at tigers. You've got to be willing to sacrifice your life in order to gain something that's so perfect and so holy, it's enlightenment. And if you're not willing to give up your life, you're not really, you know, uh, you're not really worthwhile, you're not a worthwhile monk. So then I came to Thailand and I ordained as a monk. And um, uh, I remember very clearly, that bag is very rustly. <laughs> this particular day was a rather nice day. Um, 
And so <laughs> I went to see. I'm going to buy you a cloth bag for next week. Uh, and I went to see my abbot because I needed my visa renewing. Okay. Now to get my visa renewing, I need a car to go out and drive me around to get all my signatures from all these different monks from different temples. Uh, I need a car to take to to Bangkok to deposit all my. Um, to deposit all my documents. Uh, then I need another car to drive me back to Bangkok to pick up my documents, to go to the immigration. Uh, I need a layman with me to pay for the visa uh, and, and buy me lunch on the way. So I went to the Albert to claim my, due, my just desserts. Right? And he said, here's 2,000 baht and you get the bus. And I was feeling rather forlorn because now I'm in this quandary, do I accept the money? And it was a nice day, I didn't really want to die. <laughs> you know, my ideals said you're really going to be willing to die for your, for your principles, and I'm like, it's kind of nice outside, I don't want to die today. Uh, you know, it didn't feel quite as heroic. My sacrificing myself for my ideals didn't feel quite as heroic as I thought it was going to be. So I took the money and I, and I went and and you know, I got my visa. This is one of the. This is a thing. The religion always work, religion always works in ideologies, and you always have this great set of beliefs and I would say fantasies. The reality of it is always very different. The reality of it is your mind's a mess, your concepts are a mess. You're going to have to empty out. You're going to have to change. You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to be willing to work with imperfection, with your own imperfection. You have to be willing to work with your own um, shortcomings. Uh, you have to be willing to work with your own suffering. All of these arts that I was talking about earlier, they all require a lot of practice. And practice, if you practice dance, it means you're going to have bruised toes and sprained ankles. If you're practicing Aikido, it means you're going to take knocks on the head um, before you get good at it. Um, Hopefully for rock climbing, you don't have too many uh, failures. <laughs> uh, and the same is true for meditation. You, this, this is the beginning of the path. You start to see, know, and understand your own imperfection. You feel your own dukkha, you feel your own suffering. And this is when you start to do the practice. Now, if you're new to Buddhism, the next bit might not make sense, but there are teachings in Buddhism that say you've got nothing to do, nowhere to go, you're already attained. Um, the Mahamudra, the Dzogchen. Um, I was with one Thai teacher, he's, he's just so highly attained, he's on another plane altogether. Uh, and he said to me, he said, can you do that thing that you just did with your mind? You can see your mind this time. And I'm like, well, I'll try. And he said, no, no, you can never try. If you're trying, you're not doing it. This kind of idea that it's got to be totally effortless. There's nothing you can do to attain it. Um, Enlightenment is already there with you. And it's actually wrong. This is the wrong teaching. This isn't the way that the Buddha taught. These people may very well know what they're talking about. They may very, usually, they may be very highly attained. But that wasn't what the Buddha was talking about. Isagadatta, uh, Krishnamurti, they would all talk from this kind of viewpoint, right? That whatever you're doing, that's not it. Whatever you're developing, that's not enlightenment, etc. The Buddha taught a path had a beginning and an end, and he called it a maga, a path, a pathway, a, play, a way that you can travel. There are certain things that you can do, there are certain perceptions that you can change, there are certain qualities that you can develop that may not be enlightenment, but they're going to take you to enlightenment. And this is the difference between the Buddha being a teacher and many of the Arahants and great sages and saints as being teachers. The Buddha could teach this mechanism, whereas many of the enlightened people, they can't. They're just like, hey man, just be enlightened. You know? <laughs> That's all you need to do. You're already enlightened, don't do anything. There is a path. Now, if you take the beginning of the path and the destination of the path, the thing that lies in between is called what? And you know where you would get it. It's called story. This is what story is. This is why I'm a very big fan of storytelling. Whenever there's a, there's a start, and you always start from imperfection, and you always head towards happily ever after. 
So if a storyteller we would say, well, you know, all you have to do is live happily ever after. You cut the story and the imperfection out, it doesn't work, right? This is the same with the spiritual path. It starts with the imperfection, but there is a change, there is a development, there is a learning that takes you towards the goal in the end. This story will include a number of different factors. Um, and in a couple of weeks we're going to go through one of the fairy tales, which is a very good example of this. Uh, you need the, the hero, he needs to be, he or she needs to have innocence, uh, they need to be strong because of their innocence, they need a weapon, uh, usually they have a sidekick, um, and you put all these factors together and this is the spiritual path, this is the, this is the path of change. And sometimes it's hard, sometimes you really have to learn the hard way. Like, um, like flammable and inflammable, I learned that one the hard way. Uh, actually mean the same thing, if you didn't get that. <laughs> so, story. Um, you're starting from this point of your own imperfection, your own suffering. Now you can't get very far in Buddhism without coming across the word suffering. So the word suffering comes from the word dukkha. Uh, dukkha can be translated a number of different ways, but one of the ways that isn't a good translation is suffering. But that's the translation we've got lumbered with, so that's the word that we kind of use. It doesn't really mean suffering. There are other words, like uh, Annie here was saying, unsatisfactoriness, uh, which is a very good definition, it's a little bit long, and it's hard if you're not a native English speaker. Uh, Thai speakers find problems with this word. Uh, suffering is a lot easier. Um, uh, stress is another one. And this is, a, this is a word that is used by Tanitra Bhikkhu, who translates a lot of the suttas. He uses the word stress, um, which I hate it. Like that, you know, Buddhism doesn't mean you're stressed out and you're getting no stress. That's therapy, it's not Buddhism. Right? And, and then actually, it was Arthur here, as a, our engineer, he pointed out to me that. Uh, if you make a bridge and you, you have two pillars and between it you have a load and the, the, the structure of the bridge has to bear the load and that is stress. The, the bridge is under stress, it's under pressure to, to change, it's under a load, it's under, it's under force. That is quite a nice concept of suffering You're un, or, or of dukkha. You're under some kind of force, some kind of pressure that keeps you moving. You're un, under some kind of load. Well, translation for Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana is Hinayana is the lighter load, Mahayana is the heavier load. Mahayana is the heavier load because you have to save all well beings as well as yourself, so it's a bigger burden to bear. Personally, I like the lighter load, that, that appeals to me. <laughs> uh, some other words, uh, the, wa the wavering, the unsteady, uh, the uneasy, I actually like these definitions because the definition of enlightenment is the opposite, the unwavering, the immutable, the unshakable. These are all words that the Buddha used for uh, enlightenment. And the actual meaning of the word dukkha uh, comes from the idea of something being eccentric. Not, in the, not like an Englishman, but like a wheel <laughs> that is not quite in balance. Uh, and if any of you have changed your car tires, one of the things they do when they change the tire on your car is they'll uh, charge you or tell you that you have free balancing. <coughs> Not many people know what balancing is, but even the modern day wheels, when they come from a manufacturer, they're not perfectly weighted, they're slightly off-center. So when you're driving down the road at 70 miles an hour, uh, or 7 miles an hour if you're in Bangkok, uh, the difference in the weight starts to shake and it will literally shake your vehicle apart if there is a slight difference in the weight. So what they do when they balance your wheel is they stick these little tiny weights around your wheel to make it balance out perfectly so that you're, you're, you're not being shaken. So that's the meaning of the word hooker, literally. It means, you, it means off center, it means a, a wheel that isn't quite centered properly and it's shaking. Uh, it means this is our motivation going through life. We always have this dis-ease that's pushing us to more and more activity. Now this ease is not suffering. We're not saying that you have to walk around hanging your head and you know, be thoroughly miserable if you want to be a Buddhist. You know, we tend to be happy people. Monks and nuns tend to be happy people. 
Um, but there is always this disease behind your uh, existence. This disease, then, this suffering, this dukkha, is um, uh, described as three kinds. Dukkha, dukkha, ta, vipari, nama, dukkha, ta, and sankara, dukkha, ta. Talk about practice, I had to practice that one to get it out in one go. Dukkha, dukkha, ta is the suffering of um, uh, suffering of suffering. Uh, or unpleasant suffering. Uh, Viparinama dukkata is the suffering of change, and Sankara dukkata has a few different translations, but I'm going to present it as the suffering of mind states. Uh, in the Tibetan tradition, they're usually translated as all pervasive suffering, the last one, uh, but actually I think it means mind states. First one, dukkha dukkata, then, the suffering of suffering, there are two kinds, bodily and mental. Bodily suffering is a pain. And, and the discomfort that you feel in the body. And one interesting point, even the Buddha had physical uh, unpleasantness, physical suffering. Which raises the question, uh, thanks to Marcus, who may be on the video, maybe watching this on the video, uh, he raises the question, like, didn't the Buddha go beyond suffering? Well, how then did he have physical suffering? Because that's a kind of dukkha. Uh, I've never actually found a satisfactory answer to that question. Uh, one of the suttas describes him as coming out of his hut in the morning and he sees a ray of morning sunshine landing on a log and he sits on the log and he warms his old aching back and he says to his attendant his body is getting old, it's getting sick uh, it's getting patched together like an old cart uh, in not too many years it's going to pass away and he warms it back in the sunlight the commentary to the Sutta says Buddha didn't get any pleasure from feeling the sunlight. He was charging his aura up so that he could use it for the betterment of all world beings. <laughs> Little bravado, Buddhist bravado from that. Uh, I actually like the, the idea that he went out and he warmed his back in the morning when he was 76 years old or something like that. That's my kind of Buddha. I like that, that kind of uh, concept. So everybody has physical, um, everyone has physical suffering. Uh, the second kind of the dukkha dukkha, suffering of suffering, is a mental suffering, the pain, sorrow, lamentation, grief, and despair of the mind, uh, is how it's described. Uh, it's also described as the second arrow. So uh, if you imagine you were shot with an arrow, and instead of treating that, you were to pick up a second arrow and start stabbing yourself with it. Would that be a wise thing to do? Well, so the Buddha said that when you have physical uh, suffering, what you do is you create all this mental suffering on top of it. And uh, Annie Lambo here, she can talk to you more about this than me. I've been blessed with a uh, relatively pain-free body, um, but she's had to work through, um, through her lifetime with a lot of physical suffering. Uh, and you learn the hard way to not create all this uh, mental suffering and anxiety on top of things that have happened to you. So like somebody gives you an insult and you repeat the insult to yourself a thousand times, uh, you're creating all this mental suffering on top of what originally actually wasn't that bad. Some people never forget an insult. Right? Personally, I never forget a luncheon line. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, creating all this mental suffering that you don't need. And when you start to watch this process, it becomes very interesting just how much of your own suffering you're creating for yourself. If you can just reduce that much, you've already done a lot in your lifetime. So the mental suffering is like, a, I think of it like a big bag of topics that you carry around with you. And whenever you have five minutes free, you're stuck in the traffic, you go rummaging around in your bag and you fish something out and you suffer over it something somebody said, or my childhood, or, you know, things that I want to get. Remember wanting, as I explained, as we were talking last week, uh, focusing on what you want gives you a kind of desire or liking, but that's also kind of suffering, right? When you're wanting, that's the same as the feeling of lacking something. And when you're lacking something, you have a disquiet. So this also is suffering. Again, it's not hanging your head and beating yourself up. But it is a kind of, it's still a kind of suffering, it's still a kind of disquiet or a dis-ease. 
So you have this big bag of stuff that you carry around with you and you fish something out and suffer over it at every given opportunity. Um, we're drawn to these topics of suffering, things that you want to get, things that you want to get rid of, or things that you want to, stimulation that you want to entertain yourself with. We're drawn to these topics of suffering like moths to a candle flame. This particular kind of dukkha dukkata is, according to the suttas, covered by movement. And if you have enough movement, it covers up or it hides this kind of suffering. Uh, so, for example, I'm washing you all here, and every so often, you're sitting pretty still actually, you're pretty good, pretty meditative. But every so often you're going to shuffle. What is a shuffle? What are you doing when you shuffle? Does it feel nice to change position? Just now I switched my position, that feels quite nice, for a short while. Are you seeking pleasure, or are you hiding the suffering? The truth is, if you sit for very long, um, five, ten minutes, your body starts to suffer, it starts to feel pain. My own teacher has Parkinson's disease, uh, advanced Parkinson's, and he can't shuffle, he can't move. Basically, we lift him up, we plop him down in a seat, and then however he lands, that's how he stays for the next hour. And he doesn't complain, but you know, if you ask him and you push him, actually he's, extreme, he's in a lot of pain, but he can't move himself around. And same goes for mental suffering. If you can keep your mind going fast enough, you don't suffer over stuff. And this is one reason why when people go on meditation retreats, they start crying or things start coming up that are difficult to handle. Because in daily life, you've got too much going on. The mind is moving at too much speed for you to really get too engrossed in what she said to me or what he did or why I was fired from my, fired from my job for an unjust reason or uh, whatever it is that you want to suffer over. You keep yourself moving. Second form of dukkha, uh, of dukkha there are these three forms, uh, and that's the end of the talk, so we're getting close to the end. Uh, we pray now with dukkha, the suffering that comes from change. And the suffering that comes from change is a lot harder to see. There's a nice little story in the suttas about the Buddha's cousin uh, that illustrates this. And after the Buddha became enlightened, he went back home uh, to teach, to, you know, he discovers enlightenment, you know, who are you going to tell? He's like, you go back and tell you, you know, your parents, and your former wife, and your son, and all the rest of it. So after he went home, the clan decided that this king of theirs, who was living out in the forest like a hermit, needed looking after. So they said, all right, well, some of us are going to have to, like, disrobe, are going to have to ordain and go into the forest and live under the trees uh, with him, and some of us to look after him, and some of us will have to stay back and be kings of the kingdom. And the Buddha's, I think it's his cousin, Anuruddha, said, you know, chaps, I wrote this great idea. You guys can go and ordain as monks and live in the forest. I'm going to stay here and be king. I'm going to stay and look after the, the land. And they said, so, okay, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, get the harness in. And they said, well, what are you going to do then? He said, well, then I'm happy. And they said, but, you know, you've got to get ready for winter. He said, yeah, okay, so I'll get ready for winter. Um, and they said, well, then what are you going to do? He said, well, then when spring comes, I'm happy. But, You've got to plant the crops then. And he said, well, like, yeah, well, I'll plant the crops. And then, you know, oh, it'll be good. You can see where it's going, right? I don't have to go through the whole, the whole year. Whatever it is that you attain to or you get to, there's always more that you have to do in lay life, especially. So after a while of contemplating this, I said, you know, chaps, I have this great idea. You guys can stay and look after the fields. I'm going to go and become a monk with the Buddha. <laughs> Uh, and he did, and he became one of the great arahants. I actually have the same thing with cleaning my bathroom. Uh, like six months ago, I gave it the clean to end all cleans. Uh, and then last month, somebody visited me and said I had a filthy bathroom. You're going to do it again, right? <laughs> Men living on their own, we, we don't understand these kind of things, you know. Uh, the, the point being that everything changes, so there's never any point that you get to where everything is stopped and everything is all right. And the Buddha described it like this. He said, it's easy to see it in the body. The body will change. After 50 years or 100 years, 
the teeth will fall, will turn yellow and fall out, and the back would become crooked as a roof rafter. This is using scriptural language. Um, and that is easy to see, but to see that the mind is continually changing is very difficult to see. The truth is that the mind changes from moment to moment, like a monkey swinging through the trees. It grabs hold of one branch, and it lets go to grab hold of another branch, continually as it swings through the forest. In exactly the same way, the mind arises as one thing and ceases as another. I'm paraphrasing the, the, the quote from the scriptures. This is as close as we can get to the actual Buddha's teaching. And this is the impermanence in the mind, and when you see it in this way, it starts to see it, it actually is. It's, the mind is a rather unpleasant place to be. You start to get this desire for stability, you start to get the desire for something that lies separate or independent of the mind. And this is where we're starting to really get on the path towards the zone, this emptying out, because you start to see the value of it. Uh, the Vipari Namadukata, by the way, the suffering of change is covered by something called Santati, uh, is continuity. Uh, I also did a talk about this last year, a very interesting topic. In psychology it's called object permanence. Uh, and in the space of a sentence, it means we treat things as being real and continuous. So my friend Arthur here, I treat him as being real and continuous uh, person. The truth is, when you look at your own experience, uh, what you see is mind states arise and they disappear. My, more mind states arise and they disappear. Concepts arise and they disappear. This is the actual truth. But our concepts give us this sense of solidity in the world. These concepts are exactly what we have to give up. Um, so that's covered by Santati. The last one, uh, or, or object permanence, the last one is Sankara Dukkata, which is the suffering of just having mind states. That's interesting. Just to be is a kind of suffering. Uh, Saint John of the Cross uh, is a Spanish mystic, one of my favorites. He described it this way. He said it's like a window that is dirty. The sunlight can't get through the window. The dirt interferes with the sunlight. But if you clean the window till it's absolutely spotless, the sunlight will pass through unhindered. And he said exactly the same way. It's when you have yourself there, you're going to be in sin, or suffering in the Buddhist terminology. But if you move yourself out of the way, if you polish yourself to, absolute, to be absolutely spotless, then God will act through you without interference. I actually like this analogy. Zen often has the same analogy of the, uh, polishing something so it's completely spotless, completely stainless. Uh, the eye of Dhamma was considered as a stainless uh, eye of Dhamma. Now this kind of suffering of just having a mind state, usually you just ignore it, right? So what? <laughs> you don't need to be too bothered by that. Lobotomy. You have a lobotomy, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can just ignore it. Um, and most people do. Most people are not really that interested in the spiritual path. You can just ignore this. My friend Jan, who's not here tonight, but he describes it this way. Please excuse his French. He says, it's like smelling your own farm. You don't care. <laughs> right? You can just ignore it. This suffering that you carry around with yourself, you can ignore it. This suffering of just having a mindset, you can ignore it. But it still counts. It's still there. And if you can get in touch with that, if you can see that, this is what we call in Buddhism Sandega, or the uh, being shaken and, and stirred. One up on James Bond. Uh, being shaken and stirred, which means you have a motivation to practice the holy life. You have a motivation to find that zone that is absolutely still, pure, stainless, spotless. Enter into that zone of complete emptiness. You now have a motivation to do it. So that is the um, Sankara Dukkata. The Buddha said there are two kinds of fool. One who shoulders a burden he should not, and one who does not shoulder a burden that he should. So in Buddhism, this is the burden that we should shoulder. This is the, um, uh, this is the kind of Dukkha that we want to be looking at to give ourselves the motivation and make clear the direction and which direction the spiritual life lies. This emptying out, this giving up of all of it. Uh, of everything, 
of stopping still in this pristine awareness. So, it's my contention that all of these uh, teachings are leading towards emptiness. They're not meant to be picked up and used as teachings, uh, per se. Uh, they're not meant to be um, figured out. Take something like non-attachment. You, you will never figure out non-attachment. And some people try. They want to get non-attached to my husband. That's easy. I get non-attached to my children. I'll get non-attached to my house. Uh, get non attached to my computer, I'll save that one to the end until I'm just about to get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> you can't non attachment doesn't work with, with knocking things off like a like some kind of you know shotgun that you're shooting these things down. It doesn't work that way. You can't get non attachment, you can't make it happen. Uh, I've got one example. The, the, there was a temple that I lived in and some local people figured out that if um, uh, some people figured out that when the gong goes, all the monks go down to the chanting, and that's the perfect time to steal stuff from the monastery. And so this went on for several days, and the monks are having this conversation that I find quite incredulous. They're having this conversation because all their huts, all their cruises, didn't have locks on the door, and they were deciding whether they should put a lock on the door or not. And one of them, I think he was German, but not with something to do with it. And uh, he said, we must not put locks on the door. This is attachment. This means we're attached to the things in our hearts. We should leave, the do we should leave it open. This is trying to force non-attachment as some kind of ideology and force fit it onto the world. It doesn't work. Right? Ties never fall into that mistake. They put a lock on the door. And if they catch the thief, they'll give them a good, good beating. In fact, this guy here has a very good story about that. <laughs> Non-attachment, when you try to, to, to figure it out, it doesn't work. All of these teachings are to be used to empty out, not figure out. That's a good catchphrase, right? So if you take nothing else, um, empty out, don't figure out. We are drawn to suffering like moths to a flame, is one of the um, teachings of the Buddha game. And there's a very good reason for this. The reason moths and some insects will fly into a flame is normally they navigate by the moon. And as they're flying, if they start to change direction, the moon will change in relation to the, di to the direction they're flying. So they adjust. But the moon stays still. When it sees a candle flame, it mistakes it for the moon and it starts to navigate by the candle flame. And as it's moving then, the candle flame changes position in relation to the moth, so it adjusts its course in natural navigation. The moth is doing the right thing, but it's taking the wrong thing as the guiding light. So that is what I would like to uh, leave you with, that we are, as human beings normally we, we're hanging on to our suffering and we're chasing after pleasure, and these are the wrong lights to guide our lives by. It doesn't mean that you don't have pleasure, it doesn't mean you don't enjoy things, but it means that the pleasure or sense-seeking is not the guiding light by which you live your life. To put, uh, put it this way, most people rushing headlong, missing about what's essential, creating one new bond after another, like insects into a flame. Some people are intent only on what is seen and heard. So we have some time to empty out, and uh, it's also an important part of the evening to uh, put into practice a little bit uh, to see what it's like when you.